for uh, maybe when I was in the womb that I was quiet. My, my mom always told me that uh, I was a night owl. I still am. I, I'm, I prefer to be awake during the night and I like to sleep during the day. I crib next to the light switch in her room and I figured out where it was on and off, on and off, on and off till she played with me. Uh, I've always been kind of a rambunctious kind of person and unfortunately my son's tenfold that way. Uh, he's a handful, so. Oh man, that'll preach, won't it? You know, there's something powerful about just reading the Word of God and not putting on what the, what the Bible has for us. Man, how amazing. I got, a, I got a little bit of an itch in my seat sometimes when people just start reading the scripture. Now, I love, I love listening to interpretations. I love to preach, uh, but called, to, called to preach. I love listening to different men's opinions and different uh, individuals' opinions about what they think. But, you know, ultimately, it's just an opinion, right? Pastors may be wrong. Our pastor's always right, of course, right? He's amazing. Um, they may have different interpretations and correct it. Right? It, the only time that it's wrong is when you stand on that, that foundation and choose to stay there when the truth is presented to you. But I say that to say that I just like to read like the, the chariots of iron. I like to, to pull that out. Uh, Jephthah's daughter, that story. I like to really kind of look in between those lines. But you know, there's nothing. But that is not the word of God. So that's what I'm going to do tonight. Primarily, I'm going to just read uh, we're going to start in Luke 23, if you'd like to turn there. Luke 23. We're going to read the whole chapter because there's something that Luke has in Luke 23 that is very particular, that sticks out. I decided to go with the Latin dialect. I think that it is a very intended and purposeful word that we find in Luke 23. Saying, we found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ the king. Stop for a moment. Imagine calling Christ someone who perverts something. He said to the people, I find no fault in this man. And they were the more fierce, saying, He stirreth up the people, teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. He himself also was at Jerusalem at that time. And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long season, because he had heard the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. And Herod with his men of war set him at naught, and mocked him, and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, and sent him together the chief priests and the rulers and the people, said unto them, Ye have brought this man unto me as one that perverteth the people. And behold, I have examined him, or I have, for I sent you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. I will therefore chastise him and release him, who for a certain sedition made in the city, and for murder was cast into prison. Pilate therefore, what evil hath he done? I have found no cause of death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. And they were instant with loud voices, requiring that for sedition and murder was cast into prison, whom they had desired. But he delivered Jesus to their will. And as they led him away, they laid upon one Simon, a Cyrenian, coming out of the country, and on him they laid the cross. To them said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming in which they shall say, Let's cover us. For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? And there were also two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place, which is called, and catch it, Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand, and the people stood beholding. And the rulers with him, with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he be the Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same? This Lord, remember me when thou comest into my kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour in my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. And all the people that came together to that sight, beholding the things which were done, named Joseph a counselor. And he was a good man and a just. The same had not consented to the council and deed of them. He was of Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who also himself waited for the kingdom of God. And that day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew on. And the women also which came with him from Galilee followed after, and beheld the sepulcher, and how his body was laid. And they returned and prepared spices and ointments, and rested the Sabbath day, according to me, Lord, that you start a revival in my heart. 
Lord, that as we go through these, this passage and we just try to understand what it is, the great miraculous work of Christ, the sacrifice that he made, the precious words that you put on the paper, Lord, I pray that you work in our, art, in our hearts, Lord, open our eyes, open our... So we have this account of the crucifixion of Christ, and it's special. Luke's account, now all four are a little bit different in some ways, but Luke's particular is very different, viewed Christ was that of the priest, the high priest, in this here. And that first got me kind of in the middle, and we was kind of more of an open forum. He raised his hand, and I got to a pause, got to a break, and he asked me, he goes, ah, I don't want to interrupt. I'm just, and you know, it's funny, this word doesn't exist anywhere except for in the word of God. Now, to us, who are used to the common things of the word, things of the world, the world didn't decide this word. The world didn't come up with this word. It's not a word that's used anymore. You know, the only place we find this word is in Luke 20, the place of a skull. It's no different than that. It's the same connotation. It's equal. I don't think that the word of God has mistakes in it. I think that God has a direct meaning to the things of Christianity. And I think that it relates to us as individuals in such a way that if we truly understand what Calvary means, it stands for you. In Luke 23, 4, it says, I find no fault in this man. 23, 15, no, nor yet Herod, nothing worthy of death. Isaiah 53, 5, slaughter. Hebrews 2, 9, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Hebrews 4, 19, but, but for us. What an absolutely amazing miracle that the God of all heaven would choose to do anything for us now it's not us, his only begotten son who knew not sin and became sin for us what a miracle christ suffered the agony of do you know the true torture of the cross was not the beatings the true torture of the cross was not the cross itself. It was not the cat of nine tails. It was not being smote. It was not the vinegar. It was not the spear in his side. The true suffering of the cross. We don't know what true sin is. We don't know what it means to be so broken in sin, to become the literal embodiment if you are backslidden, no matter if you are as holy as holy could be. We know not what happened to Christ that day. We never will. Calvary, he saw the sacrifice of a holy God for an unholy man. If we, if we could try to grasp a revolution we would have, if one man, one woman, one child could understand the difference between sin, the next thing we see that Calvary stands for, it stands for Hebrew. Acts 2.11 says, We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Christ died for us. Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And Luke 23, 45. And the veil, the physical place where Christ died, doesn't just stand for us as individuals. It stands for the entire world. But I won't do it for a stranger. I certainly won't do it for someone who slighted me. I certainly wouldn't. The commandments, the things that I've set up in my own heart, I wouldn't sacrifice myself for that person. But Christ did. And you know why? Because we're his. It hating you. I imagine my son. I want, I want him to love me. Is that selfish? And hated me with a fierce hatred. Imagine he turned away as a father to reclaim him. I'd give everything. I'd sell it all. I'd give it all to reclaim that son. Christ is no different. He's the whoever will. It's open for everybody. There it is in black and white. Everyone in the world gets to see two things that are significant in this. The superscription says that it was written in Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. Everyone that was there could read the message. Everyone there that was participating to write it in all three languages. I truly believe that. Because God wanted everyone to see the spectacle. It wasn't just for one person. It wasn't just for one who could understand in their own language. That's the Holy Spirit coming and interpreting what's going on. Because God wants everyone involved. God wants to cross natural miraculous ways such as I speak in English and it comes out in Greek. God can do that. Second thing to take notice. The veil was rent. On an annual basis, you go in there and you can read about it in the Old Testament. But this was designated just for that individual. You know what that means when it gets rent in two? We no longer need a manly high. It's intercession 
for us. We no longer need it. Full access is open. We have open communication. All we need to do is turn to him and speak. No longer. Calvary stands for forgiveness. Luke 23, 42 to 46. He said unto Jesus, Lord, this is the malefactor. Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily thou art. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was written in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, and he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having Christ waited to give up the ghost until the thief received salvation. Now, I know there was a time period. I know that it says it was the sixth. He endured a little bit longer because he knew that if he was just waiting a little bit longer, that thief, that malefactor, would come to know him as Savior. Now, that may just would gladly endure a few more hours of suffering for one soul. How miraculous does the Bible say it is when just one, but it's not simple to Christ. I imagine that he waited for that malefactor. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, I'm not 100% sure I used to be. It's been a while since I really delved into this, but I'm, I'm fairly common, fairly certain. This is the only time you find this in the account. How amazing is that? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, he says, forgive them. Who is the them? The them is not just a crowd passing by who happens to see the crucifixion. The them is not just women and the individuals who accused him of falsehoods, who asked for his death, who chose for the murder. Them are the people who stabbed him. The them are the people who whipped him with a cat of nine tails and ripped his flesh off. The them are the people who plucked out his beard and cast lots for his garments. Those are the thems. We, we, we tend to apply our common circumstances. We do. It's kind of a very mundane thing. I think, yeah, they're, they're just all just, you know, they're just church people. They're all just normal people. And it, it cheapens it. Because that's not, as such, for some of you. <laughs> How amazing. Then, from Father into thy hands, I commend my spirit. Christ was 100% man and 100% God. And he says that if we devote ourselves fully to the Father, he'll lead us to the right paths. Now, will it be the easy path? Will it be? I want to, everyone has their own, their own different preachers that they, that they like, that they like to quote. Mine's Spurgeon, but you can't deny his passion. And Spurgeon said, I feel that if God should, do we believe that tonight? If, if Christ himself appeared and said, listen, I know you followed everything. You followed the commandments. Would you argue with him? Would you complain? Would you fight? I know what I would do. I don't know if I had the faith that Spurgeon had. I don't know if I have the faith that some of you have. Place. It's not an imaginative place. It marks a specific piece of real estate on this planet. You can go exactly to the place, find mainly that it is a rough translation or a mistranslation of a Latin dialect of Golgotha, the place of a skull. And I refuse to believe it. Now that could just be my stubbornness, which most of that God put every single word, every single bit of punctuation. He aligned the word of God exactly how it should be. If we don't understand that, COVID is the big thing. Uh, even things like with the stock market currently, there's a lot of nonsense going on. There's a lot of really ridiculous. It's the word of God. And why does that matter? Because if you're not in it, you don't have an anchor. If you're not, the world would like you to go. Calvary is a simple thing. It's a simple idea that we pass over on a regular basis. How many of us have read through the New Testament hundreds of times over the time that we've been saved? I'll be going on being saved. I've never really been one. I, I, I never, and I'm not saying this as a badge of honor. I've never doubted my salvation. I, I know that I'm a piece of dirt, full and all gracious, and that he gave his son for me. I've never doubted it. But what I do doubt is my ability to understand him. I'm a wretch, and I know that I'm miserable, and I'm nothing without him, and I still choose to be without him some days. Because I choose... Just like with Peter, though, 
when he started sinking in that water and he called out for the Lord, the Lord was right there to grab him. He'll always be right there reaching out his hand. I know it's something that's very common. I like the common thing. Christ died for the common man. Christ died for someone common and mundane like me. Christ gave Calvary for something common like me. A man looks back and he sees there's sometimes there's four, there's two sets of footprints and sometimes there's one. And he says, Lord, why did you abandon me during those times? Those were tough. Look at it. And it says, no, my child, you're, you're seeing it wrong. The footprints that were missing were yours because I carried you through that adversity. Anything about the graciousness of God. We've seen but a speck of his love. But I, Lord God, I do fiercely, fiercely love you. But I have such a hard time. Such a hard time, Joe. I don't need, I don't need you to make me, make me anything. Because of how vile I am. Don't, don't leave. I have no intelligence, no strength, no power to defend myself, and I need you so desperately. Lord, I pray that you send your love and your grace and your mercy. Light there, Christian. I think, I'm thankful 